Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, Syria. We look at the power struggle through two sets of lenses, the cameras of state-owned television and the prying eyes of activists and their phone cameras. Plus, the cartoonist the authorities in Damascus tried to cripple. He's gone back to the drawing board. Journalism in Somalia is a dangerous game, deadlier still if you report for the Chabelle radio network. And child's play. A new political ad creating a buzz in Mexico. It's our web video of the week. At the outset of the Arab Spring, few news organizations could resist the allure of what looked like a promising new partnership with social media. Activists would capture the story, journalists would make it known. However, the coverage of Syria has laid bare the shortcomings of that blueprint. It's been more than a year now since the uprising began, and both sides have developed expertise in tailoring and in many cases manipulating raw news material. So authenticity is a big and recurring issue. And and with a humanitarian crisis now looming in Syria, that aspect of the story is often drowned out by the cries of battle, the sounds and imagery associated with the fighting. Our starting point this week is Damascus, where among the conflicts being played out is a fight to the death between a new model army of social media activists and the more conventionally armed media machine of the Assad government. Tank show. I don't think we've ever seen social media used so provocatively. So they can blame the people, the civilian houses are In such propagandistic ways as we have seen in the Syrian uprising. But it only gets you so far. In the end, it will mobilize support, both within the country and internationally, but it isn't going to bring down the regime. The Arab Spring has been a 16-month-long learning curve for all parties involved. That includes the media. Each country the revolts sweep through, every government that falls, provides lessons for the next regime trying to resist the winds of change. The number one lesson that Syria has learned from the media strategies of Tunisia and Egypt is don't let the mainstream media into the country. On the lies the Egyptian government continues to tell. And if you do let them in, constrain them, restrict them all you can, and don't let them just have free reign to go wherever they want. It's incredibly dangerous. Because Assad knows that if he has the mainstream media in the country, we've just been brought into this building by members of the Free Syrian Army. That will pose a great limit to the amount of force that he can use in order to hold on to power. When we got smuggled into Baba Amr, If keeping out the Al Jazeera's and CNN's is lesson number one for the embattled potentate, then lesson number two would be taking on the media that are already there, the social media within. The Assad regime uh, learned not very fast that it would have to battle on several different planes and it's going to have to engage in an information war which goes far beyond the traditional information war that the Syrian government or regime certainly thought it was quite skilled at in this new uh, internet space. It didn't have the tools to fight back. Uh, it has since fashioned those tools. And Syria has refashioned its biggest media weapon for this fight. The state-owned outlets President Assad controls, primarily television. State-run TV delights in revealing any incident that proves that citizen journalists opposed to the government are dealing in propaganda. One such incident was recently documented in a report by Britain's Channel 4 News. It was, dare I say, a slightly amusing scene to, to witness. What we saw is uh, a video journalist, an activist, uh, called Omar Talawi in a completely premeditated, pre-planned uh, venture to stage some uh, special effects, let's say, the smoking tire that they sat far to in the alleyway down below the rooftop on which he was talking. It created an effect of war zone, which is exactly what he wanted to communicate. The Channel 4 video, I'm amazed that people actually think this is news. You know, we saw this in Latakia in 2011 when newspapers around the world alleged that the Syrian government was using uh, naval ships to shell Latakia. Of course, later there was no sign of shelling, but it's the first time I learned that you can burn tires on rooftops 
to simulate the after effects of shelling. We contacted Omar Talawi to ask him uh, what his response was to allegations that he'd set things up. He was absolutely unapologetic. He said, we were absolutely desperate to command the world's attention. We did what we had to do, and this is one of the weapons in their armory. On the Assad government's list of media enemies, few rank higher than Arabic language satellite news channels. This segment aired on Syrian state-run TV. It shows a consignment of weapons. The Syrian state calls them terrorist arms. And inside the box is a selection of news channels. The Qatar-based Al Jazeera, Saudi Arabia's Al Arabiya, BBC Arabic, France 24's Arabic language channel, and Dubai-based Orient TV. Syrian state-run television has also taken issue with an hour-long documentary from inside Homs by CNN's Arwa Damon. The Syrian channel accused CNN when it filmed a pipeline explosion of collaborating with saboteurs. On the horizon, thick smoke billows from a sabotage gas pipeline. They have been accused of positioning their camera, having been alerted to the fact that something may happen. So they had their camera set up and in fact a pipeline was exploded and they were delighted CNN's it was a scoop Damon. from their perspective from my perspective it was CNN and Arwa Damon being complicit in an act of terrorism CNN issued a statement standing behind its coverage saying it was a pity Syrian citizens did not get to see it in full the Assad government now appears fully engaged in hand-to-hand computer-to-computer online combat it has lured its victims into traps by sending out mailings that, if opened by recipients and acted upon, expose the enemies of the state. And, according to the U.S.-based Electronic Frontier Foundation, a credible organization, pro-government hackers have been covertly installing spying software on activists' computers, giving the Assad government access to the data on those infected devices. The lesson for online anti-government activists if you live by the electronic sword, prepare to die that way. Social media has a huge downside if you're running an opposition against a repressive regime, and that is that it's inherently easy to penetrate. The whole point about social media is that it's meant to be easy to use and easy to access. But that's terrible if you're trying to run a revolution, because you need security, and you don't have it. And that means that an intelligence agency like Syria's will have no difficulty in hacking Facebook and Twitter accounts and identifying its opponents by those means. No one knows when this power struggle will conclude, much less how. And the stakes are far too high for either side to worry about coming out of this with their journalistic credentials in good order. However, international news outlets, the ones that use material they admit cannot be verified, over and over again, do have their credibility to consider. President Assad and his adversaries are not the only ones with a lot riding on the coverage of this story. There is a sort of righteousness uh, among the Western media because, in large part, the regime's action, which have been so violent and so wanton and so cruel, that sort of moral righteousness has had a sort of corrosive effect. There is a real uh, desire on the part of many journalists, I think, in this conflict to become sort of uh, much more committed to the struggle than their journalistic objectivity, and that has had a problematic effect on the coverage. That's Syria, more than a year into the uprising. A story that has it all, except the middle ground.